Hello, you've caught me looking through photos of my recent holiday and wishing I was still in that place. Place. It's an interesting word, isn't it? There's a deliberateness to calling something a place, as though we're consciously stamping human significance onto accidental quirks of geography. Mountains, lakes, valleys, oddly shaped rock formations, for as long as we've had language, people have infused chunks of Earth's topography with cultural and historical relevance to the point where these places sort of assume a life of their own, echoing the events and people that have touched them. In his 1967 book The Peregrine, author J.A. Baker came out with this amazing quote. He said, There is no mysterious essence that we can call place. Place is change. It is motion killed by the mind and preserved in the amber of memory. What are you talking about, Rob? I hear you say. I've come here to watch a list feature on video games, not to hear you drone on about nature writing. I know, I'm sorry, and I'm getting to the point, I promise. Basically, I've been thinking about places in video games and how they're an interesting inverse of real life. Whereas in reality, our minds give meaning to matter, in video games, our minds give birth to it. Places in games are designed, they come into existence with meaning pre-attached. Every tree, every rock, every building is there to say something, however small, about the game in which it's placed. With that in mind, here are seven of the most important places in video games. Now, let's just quickly clarify that by place, I don't just mean a setting, so this isn't going to be a list of open worlds. You know, a place could be something as small as a room, or something as big as an entire city. What we're looking at are places that, by design, influence our thinking about a game. Places that mean more than just the physical space they occupy. Anyway, let's get on with it. Our first entry is Markarth, my absolute favourite place in one of my favourite games of all time, Skyrim. The reason I love Markarth so much is because for me, the city basically acts as Skyrim in microcosm. There's the obvious surface beauty of a city carved into the side of a mountain, an architectural marvel where nature is framed by industry, where sun, water and stone coalesce into a layered, labyrinthine whole. Markarth is not like the other cities in Skyrim. Skyrim. Its beauty is entirely unromantic. You know, this isn't Whiterun perched on its lovely hill, a high fantasy flytrap for hungry Tolkienites. Markarth is like a stone fist punching through the earth. Its beauty is raw and angular. Many of its buildings reappropriated ruins of the ancient dwarven stronghold on which it's built. And here is where Markarth really shines. In essence, it's a pile of explorable rubble, an exquisite mess you'll want to poke and prod and rummage around, a wreck of bronze and stone that teases you with back alleys and doors to secret places, places that feel hitherto untouched and unknowable until you, the Dragonborn, come along to touch and know them. Like Skyrim as a whole, Markarth makes you feel as though you have discovered it, like you are the first one inside those dwarven ruins for hundreds of years. You soon discover you can't simply poke about in Markarth. You don't open a door and peek inside. You fall inside. You're sucked into depths from which you may not surface for hours, and when eventually you do return, gasping for air, you'll likely have forgotten why you opened that initial door in the first place. And this is Skyrim. It's a place to get lost in, and Markarth is exactly that. Not to mention the stories of the people who live there, stories you can choose to brush past on your way elsewhere, or stop, peel back and explore. Markarth is a simmering cauldron of class, race and conflict. You could honestly set a 10 hour story here and it would not feel old. 
And then there are the Dwemer ruins underneath the city, the name of which I can't pronounce. Incredible. Off topic a little bit, but it's always been a dream of mine that one day we'll have an Elder Scrolls game set thousands of years in the past, when the Dwemer civilization was at its peak. Or maybe finding out about the Dwemer would kill the magic, because I love being down here and letting my imagination fill in the blanks. Another thing Skyrim and Markarth does better than most. Your mind is given time and space to both wonder and wander. What a place this is. Next, we've got the nuclear weapons disposal facility on Shadow Moses Island, specifically from Metal Gear Solid 4. In Metal Gear Solid 1, Shadow Moses is an incredible setting, but in Metal Gear Solid 4, it's a place used to direct our interpretation of the game's themes. There's so much going on here, it's impossible to pin down in words, but let's have a go anyway. This place is a ruin, a shell haunted by the memories of the player. And that is the amazing bit. This place means something different to every single person playing. Those echoes of the past experienced by Snake as he shuffles through the abandoned helipad will ignite unique memories for each individual. Personally, I'm transported back to when I first played MGS1 with my dad. The thrill of successfully sneaking past our first security camera, of picking up that box of chaff grenades guarded by those two massive searchlights. Exploring this place is like exploring a physical manifestation of yourself from 10 years ago. Being here triggers reminiscence of an entire decade. The crumbling ruin encouraging you to think about what you've lost, how your life has changed. There's a coldness and a tangible absence to this place too. Ten years prior, it was thrilling and electric. Now, it's a maudlin nothingness. Go up a layer and it's all about how video games and, in a broader sense, technology as a whole has changed as well. Physical replaced by digital, organic by synthetic, human by AI. Yes, it's all dramatically Orwellian, but as you sneak through those familiar halls, evading soulless machines instead of human guards, you realise a considerable emotional personal response has been roused by this one deliberately designed place. Entry 3 is the city of Leia Mond from Vagrant Story, possibly my favourite video game setting of all time. As a place, it's essentially a bricks and mortar reflection of protagonist Ashley Riot's enigmatic, locked off mind. Without wanting to spoil too much, I still insist you play Vagrant Story if you never have, Ashley's physical journey through Leia Mond mirrors his mental journey through the dark chambers of his psyche. His memory is fragmented, parts of it sealed away, the truth choked silent by the coils of past trauma. And Leia Mond is like this, it's layered and interconnected and deep and twisted. You'll battle your way through subterranean horrors, burst with relief into brief revelatory sunlight before diving back into the terrifying murk, a maze of locked doors and crumbling architecture, the city's underbelly as fragile and treacherous as old dying memories. It feels less like you're exploring Leomond than constantly escaping it, clambering through a ruin desperate to collapse beneath your feet. The Snowfly Forest in particular is a place that delights in tormenting the player, eerily bending physics as it spits you into areas you've already traversed. Leomond is trying to swallow you at the same time as you're trying to climb through it, in much the same way Ashley subconsciously scrambles to bury his past, while antagonist Sydney simultaneously dredges it up and dangles it over his head. Occasionally you will emerge into these beautiful sunlit areas in Leomond, you know, you don't want to leave them. But just like Ashley wishes he could stay in blissful denial, talking wine while picnicking with his perfect family, there's an inevitability to the fact you've got to shatter the falsehood, take a deep breath and dive into the unpleasant truth, or as Leia Mond would have it, a fight with countless undead horrors. Let's lighten things up with entry number 4, Mount Chiliad from Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, a place I must have spent at least 40 of the 200 hours I put into this massive game when it first came out. 
Mount Chiliad embodies the essence of GTA in 2004. Huge, open and purpose built for mischief. Oh, the fun I had on Mount Chiliad. I loved this playground Rockstar built for us. It was remote and high, the perfect place to murder NPCs. And also it had a little ramp at the summit, as if I wouldn't have driven cars off the top anyway. But I went a little bit further than that. My favourite thing to do was grab a tow truck, pull an unsuspecting driver all the way up the mountain. I learned quite early on that drivers would stay in their vehicles when you were towing them. Even better. I'd then floor it for the ramp, bail at the last second and watch both vehicles sail into the blue. Giggling like an idiot and wondering what other awful things I could do up here. Mount Chiliad was an invitation, a blank canvas begging you to scribble your own bedlam all over it. It became something else in my mind too. A comfortable retreat, either from difficult in-game story missions or from the stresses and anxieties of real teenage life. Had a tough day at college, failed the supply lines mission a bunch of times, go hang out at Mount Chiliad. It was like a virtual play park. And if I wasn't there causing havoc, my sister would be on her save and I'd be sat in her room watching. This place took on a meaning of its own for my sister and I. You know, if we were ever told off by a relative we both hated, we'd look each other in the eye and be like, Chilia? Yeah, go on then. Tow this one. <laughs> yes. Up you go. And down again. Entry 5. And there are few places in video games more iconic than Resident Evil 2's police station. It's a small place, at least compared to some on this list, and very much feels like the slow, sinister heartbeat of a game designed to unhinge, confuse and ultimately terrify the bejesus out of you. It's a treacherous place, preying on your pre-existing knowledge of video game language and level layouts, conditioning you for maximum jump scare impact. I'm thinking specifically of that corridor with the boarded up windows. You know, you walk down there the first time, nothing happens. You walk back down there again and boom, zombie arms right through the windows. The police station is a lie, layered with lies and topped with, yes, more lies. I mean, it's not even a police station technically, is it? It was originally built as an art gallery, hence the grand gothic design and all the frames and busts. Plus, it's also kind of there to hide the Umbrella Corporation's naughty secret. It's untrustworthy, is what I'm saying. As a place, you feel as though it's constantly winking at you and could at any moment twist into something unrecognisable. This feeling is heightened by the PS4 remake of Resi 2, as you've got this incredible recreation of a place that we all know intimately. And now it's ever so slightly different, modernised, refreshed. It still feels incredibly familiar, but in the same kind of way an old friend you haven't seen for 20 years might. Like, you still know them, but they've got hidden surprises and secrets. It's an amazing place. I both love it and am terrified of it. It symbolises both joy and fear. And every time you stalk its murky halls, however many times you play Resi 2 or the remake, you can never trust the Raccoon City Police Station 100%. Care Moran and the surrounding countryside in The Witcher 3 is next up, and I love the audacity of this chunk of open world. Like, it really doesn't need to be there. You've got the castle, yes, we need that for all the story beats that happen within it, and as a place, that could probably go on this list. But what I'm talking about is this. This raw slice of blue, white and green that stretches into mountains and a lake and a forest is there simply for you to exist in it. I mean, yes, there's a bit to do here, but if CD Projekt wanted, they could definitely have shoved all the quests and side activities into the already massive slabs of open world that are Velen, the Skellig Isles, and Tucson. Making the surrounding country open and explorable is as unnecessary as it is absolutely glorious. It's like CD Projekt Red recognised their world wasn't simply a big bowl of trees for players to do things in, but a place where people simply like to be. One of my favourite open world pastimes has always been simply to 
past the time. I like standing and looking at things for a bit, listening to the wind, absorbing as much of the essence of a place as possible, letting the world's roots take hold. And this place around and including Caremoran, for me, seems built just for that. It's a picture you can walk into. It's there simply to be admired, an ode to the natural beauty of high fantasy landscape. You don't really get attacked here. You don't have to worry about drowners or harpies. Just get on your horse and ride through it. The final place on our list is physically the smallest, but in terms of its importance to the game of which it's a part, Sarah's bedroom at the start of The Last of Us is absolutely massive. Everyone noticed the detail when they first booted up this game. The entire house does an incredible job of anchoring you in the familiar, the everyday. This beanbag is for sure the best beanbag I've ever seen in a game. And you might laugh at that, but I honestly think it's important. I look at that beanbag and I know instantly what it feels like to sit on. You know, I can see the texture. It's an object I know. Same with the warm electric glow of the television painting dark room interiors with ghostly light. We all know how that looks. Everything in here is painstakingly designed and modelled in such a way that we recognise it as normal. This house, and in particular Sarah's room, is normality perfected. The sound of her feet on the different floor textures throughout the house. The buzz of that mobile phone that's been left on a worktop. These are the sights and sounds of the everyday. We all know what's going to happen to it. No one came into The Last of Us not knowing it was a post-apocalyptic survival adventure. We know the rug is about to be pulled from under our feet. But Naughty Dog made sure the rug was the absolute perfect rug before pulling it, made it nice to look at and to stand on. There are flickers of everyone's house in Joel and Sarah's house. It's a place we all know, it's a place onto which we subconsciously stamp elements of our own lives. So when it's ripped apart, you really feel it. So there you go, our list of seven really important places in video games. Just like in J.A. Baker's quote, these places don't really exist as such until we give them meaning with our minds and make them places and the meaning you give them will be different than the meaning I give them. So let us know in the comments what video game places are important to you and why. Then give this video a like if you enjoyed it, click the notification bell to stay up to date with all our videos, and we'll see you next week for another Friday feature. Thanks for watching. For the players.